Warning, this material contains disturbing images, demonic voices, and graphic concepts, including but not limited to murder, death threats, taunts, and non-human entities. Please, for your own safety, listen with headphones or on low volume. Refrain from watching with children present, and under no circumstances recreate the material shown here. Everything you are about to see are true experiences of the crew and personnel involved. Names of murderers or organizations will not be said out loud. I first came here, I want to say it was probably 2003, 2004. Uh, the original owner's name was Walter. And um, uh, we had a couple who got in touch with us and said that they'd had an experience here and we stopped them right then and there. And I, I contacted Walter and told him that we wanted to come and do an investigation of the property. And he really tried to tell us everything that was happening at that time. And as we do, we said, nope, stop. Don't tell us anymore. We want to find out for ourselves. I mean, the architecture here is absolutely incredible. As you guys can tell, it's Christmas time here uh, in Denver and everywhere. The Moon family originally came to the house in 2004 to investigate with the past owner, Walter. They revisited the house again in 2016 under the current owner, Elaine and Joel Bryant. Uh, I actually first started working with the ghost box back in 2005. Uh, basically, Frank Sumption was the man who created a physical medium, and he's the one who gave me the device. And uh, a lot of people know the story. I didn't think that it worked, honestly, for about a year. And then I took it out to the Sally house and used it at the Sally House and was shocked when I heard the voice of the little girl that we captured dozens of times on open air EVP come through the machine with the help of what I call spirit technicians. Uh, some people call them spirit guides, but uh, it was absolutely amazing. And from that point forward, I started using it for paranormal investigations. And then soon after, I actually started doing um, personal readings for people where they could actually communicate with their loved ones in their own voice uh, coming through the speakers of the machine. Um, using my mediumship abilities, powering the device, and receiving the messages back through. So when we first walked in, uh, I remember walking in and just seeing all the woodwork, uh, the wallpaper, you can obviously see um, all the decorations that were inside here. But I remember <laughs> right when I walked through the door, just that feeling, and, and anybody who's ever been into a haunted location and kind of sensed it, you don't have to be psychic to do so. It just felt like everything got extremely heavy uh, right when we walked in. And I knew that there was activity, I just didn't quite know where it was. When we first met Walter, we actually met in this room right here. Uh, this is the front parlor. And uh, we sat down and talked for a few minutes and then uh, Walter and my mother actually went off on their own while my father and I did the investigation through the rest of the house. And uh, some things have changed. Uh, it's not exactly as it was, but uh, I remember these huge pocket doors. And I don't know if you guys can see these right here, but they're absolutely incredible. Um, they uh, are fairly functional still, um, but these doors can lead from one room to the next. One of my favorite things is the secret passages. If anybody watched Scooby-Doo as a kid, that's always the fun thing is the secret passages. And this is one of those situations. So sorry. Well, hello. <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, this actually uh, back here, little handle will lead you into 
Hi, come on Sorry. in. No problem. <laughs> this will lead you back into the kitchen area and the back staircase. We're going to look at that here in a little bit, but it brings you back to that area. And the bar here is new. It's beautiful. It's brand new. And gets used, obviously. <laughs> a lot. Excuse me? So this area back here is new, but uh, they did just such a great job with it. And uh, we're going to kind of walk up this way. This is the man who built the house. Um, and I'm going to let some other people give more detailed history of how this all worked. But uh, John, and I believe it's pronounced Muat, uh, is the one who had the house uh, built originally. Uh, the Lumber Baron Inn was built in 1889 uh, by a man called John Muat. And uh, he was a lumber baron. He built a lot of, uh, of houses and buildings in uh, the Denver area. He was from Scotland. Uh, he built the lumber baron for his wife and five children. Uh, it's really a very intriguing uh, floor plan. It always intrigues me how the beautiful third floor ballroom was built so the entrance to it was on the back. I always had the feeling like there was some sort of, of meetings or something that took place up there where nobody was supposed to see. So we'll stop here with very little light. <laughs> and I just wanted to give you what I recounted. When we first got up here, um, my father and I were alone in the property and we got to the top of the stairs and obviously you can see what we saw. Uh, there were all these different guest rooms that were around and uh, it felt heavy right up here, uh, extremely strong. I couldn't tell at that time where the activity was coming from, but I knew that there was something uh, extremely active right here. So I noted this. Uh, we didn't do anything at that point, but I noted this spot. We have owned it for nine months. Just nine months, yeah, new. <laughs> During the first investigation in 2004, the Moon family did not have the ghost box yet. At this time, traditional methods of paranormal investigation were used. Uh, first time we were here again, it was me and my father alone. It was nighttime. And we started setting up some very basic equipment. We didn't have the box, the ghost box at that time. So we decided just to take pictures, do some recordings, night vision, uh, things like that. And I remember, I'll actually show you the spot where I was. And I had some equipment on the floor, and I was setting up a recorder. And in the room, what sounded like from above, up in the ceiling, you heard a man's voice. Yelling. The thing that was significant about this is it's the first time that I've ever seen my father react to something paranormal. I'm a skeptical believer, so I have to feel it, touch it, taste it. He jumped up and he said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, I heard it. I didn't think that you did. And he said, but we're all alone here. And I said, yeah, that's the point. They're trying to communicate with us. And we did uh, an EVP session in here. We started capturing uh, orb energy, uh, moving through on night vision cameras inside the room. And he became pretty uneasy at that point. So uh, we were dealing with something really interesting. The other thing that came out of that, and I'll explain more as time goes on, is something called direct electronic response EVP. It's the first time we ever got it. <clears throat> when we uh, went back and listened to our recordings that we got from, from here, uh, it sounded like in the responses, we'd ask a question, for instance, what is your name? And in the response, you hear scratch, scratch, pop, 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 pop. It sounded like electronical interference, basically. And uh, we didn't know what it was. Later, we found out if you slowed down these recordings, time after time after time, there would be four paragraphs of human speech within these scratches and pops that were coming through. And the first one that we ever got was right here. And it was an old man's voice talking about how he watched something terrible happen. And we didn't know what that was about. We did it soon after. And then the next owner uh, had it, I think for about 10 years. And then Walter Keller, when he bought it, he was the one who's responsible for the restoration back to the original floor plan. And uh, he purchased it in 1991. The original investigation with Walter Keller took place in 2004. Okay. So we got back down onto this floor and my father and I literally went through almost every room inside the location. Quiet. There was nothing, no activity. 
And my father, I know, started to question at that point, was he crazy? Did he just think he imagined things upstairs, so on and so forth? So I went back to this spot. And I remember uh, stopping at this room. And the feeling that I had was just overwhelming. Um, again, it went from just complete silence to this feeling of, bang, you need to go in. And it was this feeling of hesitance. Um, I knew I needed to go in, but I was almost afraid to. So I uh, went into this location right here. Now the room has changed quite a bit, um, especially since the new owners have come in and they've redesigned it a little bit. But I'll, I always remember when I first came in this room, it was red. It was that really kind of Victorian red. And the feeling in the room was almost like electrically charged. That's the only way I can describe it. And I got to about this point in the room right here, and I couldn't move any further. I couldn't go any further past this point. Still don't know why. So I really kind of focused back over here. And I'm standing right here, or close to right here. My father was over in this area, and he was just snapping picture after picture after picture. And he was capturing a lot of orb energy and mist energy inside the room, completely unexplained. There was an activity, nothing was kicking up dust. There was no false positives or anything along those lines. So he was pretty blown away by that. But I remember I pulled out my recorder and I hit the record button. I was getting ready to, to, to hit the record button. I hadn't actually. I was getting ready to hit it. And in my ear, to the point that my hair actually moved, I'll never forget that, a woman screamed in my ear, get out, get out, get out. And I dropped the recorder. It hadn't been turned on yet. And I dropped the recorder on the floor. It went under the bed, fell and went under the bed. And it took every ounce of courage I had at that moment to literally just bend down, reach underneath the bed and pull the recorder out. And I looked at my father and he saw how shaken I was at that point. And we knew we had to get out of here, that there was something, uh, that, that, yeah. <laughs> something bad that had happened here. And uh, when we met back up with Walter and we told him about all the experiences we had in the house, but culminating, with this one in this room. He looked at me like I was the biggest liar in the world. And he said, you've obviously researched what happened at the house. And I said, no, I have done no such thing. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's when he told us about when the two girls were murdered inside this room. And him validating that to me right there was one of the most extraordinary moments I've ever had in my life, and one of the most frightening. And that, uh, that began the story. Carolee and Marianne were murdered in the Lumber Baron in 1970. Their killer was never caught. There was a double homicide back in 1970, and there were two young, young women that were murdered. Um, and they're younger than the age of my own children. They were 17 and 18. So I very much feel very maternal towards them. I feel very motherly towards them. And from the day that we started pursuing buying this house, I really felt like my job with the girls was to protect them, protect their integrity, their honor, their dignity. Uh, I will never allow anyone to take advantage of the girls or use them as um, a marketing tool or an enhancement, that's very, very important to me. My intent, I mean, I was very eager to hear what you had to say because I love this kind of stuff and I was, was very excited about that, but also pretty much in my mind was really, I'm, we, the house was still so new to us that I didn't really understand too much and so I really didn't want anybody coming in and messing that up. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, within five minutes of meeting you, I absolutely felt this level of comfort that we were so on the same page. Um, 
you had far more of a relationship with the girls mm. than I did and that was very evident and I had that feeling and it was just clear in in your compassionate speech of the girls and all of that. So I knew, uh, like I said, within five minutes that this, this is game on. Carol Lee and Marianne were first heard through traditional means of paranormal investigation in the 2004 visit to the house. Upon later visits, Denver law enforcement became involved when information about the girl's killer surfaced. Uh, so we started doing our investigations here first doing standard EVP. Um, not having the device, and then once we did get the ghost box, we started to use it here very successfully. Um, Carol Lee and Marianne uh, would come through in their own voices. Um, first, they sounded very confused, um, almost in a dream state, and then over time, especially Carol Lee, started to really calm her energy and communicate with us effectively. She gave us license plate numbers, phone numbers, names, all sorts of amazing information, and. We started to, to document all of it and just write it all down, not knowing exactly what we would do with it. Um, it was interesting because uh, the former owner was the one who suggested that we start doing our Ghost Hunter University events here. And when we started doing our Ghost Hunter University events, uh, the public that would come in would actually ask some really great questions over the ghost box. And we'd be able to speak to the girls directly and get more information about the crime and what had happened at that point. And in, in, during one of our investigations, we actually had a law enforcement agent uh, who came to the uh, investigation. He thought that it was completely fake uh, when he came in. Um, long story short, by the time it was over with, uh, the girls had given him some information through the device in, in this very room in the Valentine Suite that he heard uh, that was in a closed uh, file that nobody knew about. And it was enough for him to start digging back into the case and see if there was anything to it. And uh, we worked with him for quite a while. And again, we held many more events here gathered a lot of information, and rumor has it that the Denver Police Department actually reopened the case as an active cold case file based on some of the information that we were able to provide them. Little did the team know, the killer wasn't so far away. I still think one of the most extraordinary events that we ever held here um, was where, unbeknownst to us, the person of interest actually came to our event. And it was interesting because Frank Sumption, the man who created the device, uh, did a rare public demonstration of the machines. And I'll never forget hearing this man's name come through repeated times uh, through the devices to the point that I actually had to go to the back of the room where he sat by himself and ask him, do you understand what's happening here? And, and when it first started, he was annoyed by it and uh, basically didn't pay any attention. Um, but as time went by and I kept asking more questions, it turned out that he had lived in the neighborhood. He actually inherited a house from his mother, uh, which he used to live in, and moved back into the neighborhood. Then he said he'd never been into the Lumber Baron house before. Um, but as I pressured a little bit more, it turned out that he actually had a girlfriend who lived inside the house and he'd been in the house several times. So that night when we were doing the investigation portion, our group came in uh, to the Valentine Suite and I set up the device um, in the same spot that I always did. It was uh, one of the black boxes, one of the second generation devices. And I turned the machine on and before I could even do my introduction, speaking to the spirit technicians, the girls came through the speakers so clearly. He's here, he's here, he's here. And him bolting out of the, of the room, it was just, it was really frightening and very, very disturbing. Between the years of 2004 and 2015, the Moons held several public Ghost Hunter University events for countless attendees. During that time, evidence was collected through the use of both standard EVP as well as incredibly accurate communication through the Ghost Box with the girls. When the Moon family and the Ghost Box Paranormal Society returned to the house in 2016, it now belonged to the Bryants. Again, they met with the girls who were now able to speak through the ghost box. So we, we had just met Chris um, that day. Uh, I think it was two weeks or maybe a week after we bought the place. It was just almost instantaneous. So right on top of each other. And you came out and uh, we met in the front parlor and talked for half an hour, 45 minutes. I never, I'd never been in the house prior to uh, seeing the house for the first time when we came to look at it. And so... 
you know, so that was interesting. So I had no knowledge of what, 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 what it felt like prior to that. So it was really interesting. But a real interesting piece of that story is that, you know, Joel is, he very much, he's sensitive. So he very much is a believer, but he also is very skeptical. And, um, which is great. He really kind of keeps me grounded and, and he totally connected with you in a beautiful, beautiful way. And that was really wonderful. I think and then I think going up into that room because I wanted you to have a chance to see the room again have the girls see you because at that point I really hadn't been interacting with them other than my speaking to them in the mornings I come in I always would say good morning girls and, and said hey you want to come up to the room so we came up to the room there's only three of us in the house and um, I was standing right by the shower <clears throat> You were standing just about where you are right now, and Elaine was standing over here, and we were the only people in the house. And uh, you said, <clears throat> you started talking to the girls, and you said, um, I can't remember what you said, but you, you were talking to the girls, and I was standing closer to the door, and I felt a wave of cold come through me, and you instantly said, oh, they're here. And I think, you know, they were taking some energy from you, and it was, you had to come, like steady your brace, or steady yourself. And uh, <clears throat> I heard whispers behind me, you know, coming from like where the shower was. And you said, you turned to me and you said, did you hear that? And Elaine couldn't hear it because she was standing over here. But I, I said, yeah, I totally heard that. And I was so disappointed because I was like, I don't hear anything. I don't hear it. I was, I so wanted to have that experience. And I just, I didn't. I felt this level of, oh, this is going on. We're going forward with this guy, no doubt. So yeah, it really was a real, it was a point for Joel where he was like, this is it, this is, this is real. The year is now 2016. Elaine and Joel have allowed the team to come in and do another Ghost Hunter University. So we had a Ghost Hunter University event. Um, we had a Friday night portion of the event that had about 80 people and it was more focused on the psychic aspect of things and, and didn't have a whole lot really amazing happen that night, just a good night. The Saturday night event, we had 127 people who came to the event. And again, when you go into these situations, you don't really know what to expect. Um, I can never tell you that I could be prepared for something like what happened. Um, <clears throat> the class during that night was great, uh, great responsive crowd, we all had a good time. But when we went to our stations, uh, that's when the real uh, interesting things started to happen right away. Um, I remember myself and Dina came into the Valentine Suite into this room and I sat on the bathtub corner like I always do with, with the wooden device and uh, she sat on the bed across from me doing the IR cameras and wandered around the room a little bit and it's interesting the spot that we're filming in right now is very prevalent because um, we turned on the device started speaking to the girls but a voice came through it was a male voice and I recognized it but I didn't it was one of those things about a long time ago you could remember something but you didn't know exactly what it was and fairly soon we realized we weren't only speaking to the girls we were also speaking to the alleged killer and he was coming through and giving us vital information about the case immediately he was so proud of the disgusting act that he had put forward and it wasn't just him he had literally brought and i know it sounds crazy but he had actually brought demonic forces with him into the location and he told us uh, first off, we said, what's your name? He gave us the name. And we said, uh, okay, well, when did you die? And he told us it was March 2016. And we said, what did you die of? And everyone in the room heard as it said, complications from AIDS. And everybody in the room went AIDS and repeated it back. It wasn't just me hearing this. And about that time, the room got very, very cold and very, very heavy. And the normal questions went out the window at that point. We had some people who tried to ask a few different things, but we'd asked a question to one side, got to another person, and all of a sudden somebody who was standing here goes, ah, ow, and jumped. And we said, well, what's wrong? Said, the cabinet door just swung open and hit me in the leg. Immediately in my thought, because I am a skeptic in certain ways, I thought, there's no way that the, it, it's spring-loaded, they bumped it, something happened. 
and uh, didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. And we went around the room and, and again this voice kept coming through. I remember the next group that came in that was at another station downstairs who was using the Ovilus and a couple other pieces of equipment came in and said, what happened? And we recounted very quickly and they said, that's amazing because they're getting the same information downstairs that you're talking about up here. It um, was interesting just because we had a group of all different types of people. Um, so during the stations were very intense and very intriguing. Um, I was downstairs in their library area, back parlor, with Paulette doing the dowsing rods. Um, and when we were down there, we're in one of our sessions, we kept having lights flicker every time we would talk about the killer. Two sessions later, the lights completely turned off. Where I was located, I could see where the light switch was, where no one was. And as I'm starting to go walk to turn on the lights again, the lights turned on by themselves. And we had everyone in that room experience that. And it was during that time frame, I'm starting to think, okay, we're getting a lot of answers about this killer. And I go upstairs at the end of that and come talk to you in the Valentine suite where you're getting similar responses about questions we were asking. This was something that was much bigger. It was all through the house and you could feel it. Um, and again, this door kept slamming open in the back of people's legs. Behind me, uh, where you see this piece of furniture, it used to be a chimney that was there. And there used to be an ornate, ornate fireplace that was in front of it. And we couldn't figure out what it was, but one of our team members, Kristen, was convinced that there was something shoved up into the chimney, possibly a murder weapon that wasn't found. Downstairs in the library, we're asking questions about the fireplace because I became obsessed, I mean there's no other word for it, that I'm convinced and still to this day convinced something's in that fireplace. Um, but we're asking questions, getting responses, come upstairs and you tell me that there's this girl that's standing in front of the fireplace where it would be, where now is a dresser. And the door on that dresser whacked her in the leg. And then did it again multiple times. With several different people. Yeah. And after looking into the dresser, there was no way that that drawer was just going to pop open. Um, that there would have had to been force or unlocking it of some sort to get it to open. And I was that um, a woman and her husband who were uh, amateur ghost hunters had a lot of equipment and came into the room. And as they came into the room, the woman looked just like she had been attacked by something. She fell into the shower and Dina and I raced to go pick her up. Uh, and, and she just laid there. She said, no, 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 it's important what you're doing. Keep going. Don't pay any attention to me. And she literally laid in the shower asking questions through the ghost box. And we received some amazing information that night. So when we uh, decided to close down the stations, we walked out into the hallway and then up into uh, the ballroom. And I'll never forget, there was a group of people who were kind of talking and mumbling around a picture. And I went over and looked at the picture and I said, what do you guys have? And they showed me what looked like a green demonic entity that had been taken in one of the rooms. And it really shook me. And I thought, we're really dealing with something dark here. This is, this is real, this is happening. The first one that kind of floored me was the green goblin looking semi-iridescent figure. Um, so at that point, I'm like, okay, I have nothing, I, I have no answer for that. By that, there was another group of people who were talking off to the side. And uh, I walked over and I said, hey, what do you guys have? And they basically said, you're not gonna believe this. And someone had snapped a picture on their camera phone, just on the phone. And it was this dark, demonic entity. And you could see it was walking through, or the person was walking through this thing, and their face was distorted, and it had hooves at the bottom that were distinct and clear, and the body came up. And we, we thought at first that it was like this witch's hat point that was at the top. Realized later it was a collar that was there, and the head was actually far up above. So if you had to look at this thing, and you look how high the ceilings are here, it would have to be nine feet tall. Um, and it terrified me. With all the disturbing discoveries made that night, many attendees left feeling frightened and unsettled. Chris was in the process of packing up equipment when he realized he promised to do a ghost box gallery session for people spending the night at the Lumber Baron Inn. The session was conducted in the Valentine Suite. So I came down into the Valentine Suite and everyone who was staying gathered in the room, and I started doing the session. And all of a sudden, 
the woman who was in that dark demonic picture, the one that was walking through that entity, came into the room and she was just in this daze. And she looked like she didn't know what she was saying or she was, I don't want to say possessed, but she looked like an oppression, something had taken over. And she started telling us a story about how her aunt uh, was murdered at a very young age in this neighborhood and she was abducted and taken to the her elementary school and murdered, assaulted and murdered at the elementary school and that her mother couldn't go back to that school because the blood stain was left on the sidewalk and, and it affected her so deeply. And I remember her telling the story and immediately making a connection between what had happened here in this room and what had happened to this poor girl. And in my mind, I said, this has to be the same person. And as this woman rambled, all of a sudden, her energy calmed, and then she just kind of sat. And everybody else in the room started telling their stories and asking questions. The team left the overnight attendees alone at the Lumber Baron Inn that night. It didn't take long for the Ghost Box Paranormal team to receive messages from those individuals describing their intense experiences that had affected them that night. Um, the people who stayed in the Valentine Suite that night captured an EVP that they sent to me the next day. And when I heard it, I didn't believe it uh, to begin with. But it sounded like, amongst them talking, a pig being slaughtered, just being slaughtered inside the room. And it was just horrible. We got a recording of what sounds like a pig squealing. And at that point, when we got that recording, I thought, it's raccoons fighting. So we sat up in your office and I looked up raccoon fights and couldn't get anything to mimic that sound. A lot of activity tonight. Lori? Yeah. Is that your phone? Mm -hmm. Look out my phone. So what they did is they went next door to the people in the next room and they knocked on their door and they said, hey, has anything happened tonight? Did you hear any of these sounds? And the people said, no. But uh, there was a woman in the room who had awoken screaming and yelling uh, something about get him off me, get him off of me. And, but there was no strange sounds. So they went back and actually went back downstairs and did another EVP session in the downstairs area. And when they were doing that EVP session, um, they were just talking and they recorded what sounded like an ethereal goat. That's the only way I can describe it. From the south side, maybe? From the south side, maybe? So apparently at that point, they went outside and started wandering, looking for any potential animals or, or natural clues. And right underneath the window here in the Valentine Suite, they found an iron pig, a statue of an iron pig, and made the association at that point and realized the dark energy that was still there. And uh, I know it really scared them. One overnight attendee sent Chris Moon and the crew a video of her experience at the Lumber Baron. We were one of the fortunate ones that were able to grab a room for the night. We stayed in the Colorado room, my family and I did. There was my daughter, my son, my sister and her friend. My daughter and I had the bed. My sister and her friend took a mattress on the floor and my son was in a sleeping bag by the door on the floor. Um, I don't know what time it was. We went to bed about 1.30 or 2. I woke everybody up with a blood-curdling, gut-wrenching scream that just scared everybody half to death. My son jumped to his feet. He was ready to punch something, and, and he thought that he felt or saw something there. I did not. Um, I did not have a bad dream. I was sleeping very comfortably. Actually, the beds were awesome and the room was very comfortable I just sat up and screamed and I don't know why 
Then I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I apologized to everybody for waking them and um, went right back to sleep. No problem whatsoever. And um, then in the morning, we were packing up, ready to go and everything like that. I got home about an hour after I got home I realized I had this horrific bruise on my arm I did not fling myself around when I woke up I was not panicked I did not I was very comfortable I didn't hit anything when I sat up and screamed or anything like that um, but the bruise is so significant that I wanted to show you. I don't believe that I hit my arm on anything. Uh, I would have known it. It's a pretty deep, big bruise. The funny thing about it is it doesn't hurt at all. And it's significant. I'll show you. You can see it's on a unusual part of my arm. It's about the size of my four fingers, three fingers, four fingers. Um, significant size, significant depth. It's pretty deep bruise. You'd think I would be able to feel it or something, but I, I don't. At any rate, we, um, I just wanted to share that with you. You had gone home and everything like that, and we weren't able to um, share that. So I wanted to let you know, and thank you again for a wonderful tour. We'll talk to you later. It becomes apparent to the team that it's mandatory they return to the Lumber Baron in the following days to investigate, in hopes of uncovering the details of the double homicide that occurred at the location. I, I think everyone in the team developed, that hadn't been there prior, had developed this strong connection with the girls. Um, the history I had dug up on my own looking at the murder, you already have this empathy for the girls, but then when you're there and you're hearing their voices and you're hearing their torment and you're feeling like just sadness and total dread in that room it pulls at your heartstrings it pulls at your gut and I think every single team member felt like we had to go there for the girls not for any of us but for the girls once we received all the evidence that came through at that point uh, we decided that it was important that we come back and do an investigation and see if we could gather as much information about the crime that had taken place hoping that we could gather enough evidence to solve the crime or at least put the girls at peace and we came back the next day, and I'll never forget, my mother didn't want to come to the investigation. It was the first time she's ever not wanted to be associated with an investigation. That was a very difficult time for me. Um, I had just uh, had a, a falling accident, and I wasn't feeling good. I felt very vulnerable. Um, when we decided to go back, and you asked me to, to come, I really was hesitant. I didn't... I didn't want to go because I did feel very vulnerable and I was afraid that I would maybe make more problems than if we didn't do this, but I promised you I would go and I came, I was very uncomfortable, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable thinking about it right now. Um, I wasn't myself, I was in a lot of pain and it made it worse. And all I could think about was my friend that had been murdered almost um, 30 years ago. So before we could do the investigation that day, um, we had some things that really started to happen that bothered us. Our investigator, Jay, came to the house and told us about some terrible dreams that she'd been having. It was a lot of horrible dreams to the point where, I mean, she would sleep maybe four hours a night, if that, and there's a lot of waking me up and uh, the nightmares were just really eating at her. Um, Dina and I have been fighting like cats and dogs for no apparent reason. Um, and Kristen, her car would refuse to start. My car, which has not had an issue starting ever, wouldn't start. Tried it like five times. So I called you, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make it because my car's not starting, we figured it out. And as soon as I get over here, then you're telling me showing me your hand that you fell down and had taken your dog Buddha for a walk and were scraped up from taking him from a walk. My big brown lab Buddha, 100 pound guy, took him out for a walk before the investigation and uh, went two miles, came back, and he actually pulled me down out of nowhere, scraped up my hands, either broke or, or tore some cartilage in my ribs, really put me in a bad spot. And uh, we were just convinced that we weren't supposed to go back and do this investigation. Thank <laughs> you.
And we came back the next day, and I'll never forget, my mother didn't want to come to the investigation. It was the first time she's ever not wanted to be associated with an investigation, but she was frightened by it. In spite of all the roadblocks the team members faced, everyone was able to attend the investigation that night. My granddaughter brought me to the Lumber Baron that night. I was very hesitant about going because I did feel so vulnerable. And when I got there, it was pouring rain, and I thought, great, this is just like it should be. We came up, uh, we were in a rush because there was an event that night. So we met here, uh, came upstairs, actually met with uh, Joel and Elaine and did the investigation inside the room. And the evidence we captured that night was absolutely terrifying. And I think the thing that really frightened me the most was my mother's face in the pictures. It was my mother, but it wasn't my mother. So we went upstairs to the Valentine room, which is on the second floor, where the girls were murdered. We went in and we decided that we would do our investigation. We took the box out and we started asking questions. At that point, I thought I would get the dowsing rods and I would sit down on the bed and see if we were going to get any kind of information from the dowsing rods. As I sat there, I started to feel like something was pulling at me. It was very uncomfortable and I felt very frightened, started shaking really bad, and the dowsing rods started moving very, very quickly back and forth. You're very proud of that. Um, and you can clearly see how her face has changed. And as she spoke about her friend who'd been murdered and strangled with the telephone cord, which really mirrors the same time period and the same way that this crime occurred from what we can tell, um, you can clearly see the orb that appears next to her uh, with the serpent and the girl's face inside it, which I believe represents the, the murder that took place at that time. Um, that was also the time uh, that uh, we lost our team member, Alex, as well. And then, uh... I was kind of confused about things, I wasn't really, you know, I'm not really a big believer, but uh, that was when it kind of felt like a weird kind of cloudy haze kind of came over me a little bit. Um, didn't really feel like it was part of the, the group or in the room. Um, I kind of, you even kind of noticed too, that I was kind of distant at that point. It kind of got a little, a little heavy in here. Um, definitely need to get some air. Yeah, I, just, I was sleeping, woke up in the middle of the night, no reason why, and it was way darker in the room than it was normally. There was some light in there, um, like from the moon or outside lights or something like that. Um, but uh, it was crazy dark. Um, then you could see just kind of shapes moving um, across the way. Um, was there multiple shapes, like, like people or something like that, like five, six feet tall, um, just kind of walking around. So. Rushed for time and in light of evidence collected, the team makes the decision to return the very next day in a sneak attack on the killer spirit as well as the demonic entities. The team plans a final showdown and a surprise clearing. No one could have expected the dramatic events that followed. <laughs> So we decided the next day when we came back to do the final investigation and the clearing uh, that we really wanted to get as much information as we possibly could. I came in blind. I didn't really know what I was going to do. And before we came to the investigation, we stopped at a metaphysical store to get uh, some uh, sage and different things to come and do the clearing. And when I was walking through the store, all of a sudden, I saw this cross with all sorts of saints medals in it. And anybody who knows me, I'm not uh, Catholic or, or Jewish or anything along those lines. I'm more of a spiritualist. But I saw this thing and I thought, I need to bring this with me. 
And I picked up my phone and I called Elaine and I said, Elaine, I know we're not of this belief system, but would you be okay with me buying this? And she said, if you think it'll help, bring it. So I bought it and uh, came to the location. And when we got here, it was daytime. And for some reason, I decided the best thing to do was to take out all the devices I had, all the ghost boxes, and turn them on at the same time. Never done that before. We turned on an Ovilus as well. And at that point, I made an announcement to the room and I told the girls, if he tries to stop you from talking through one of these devices, go to the next one and record your voice there. And we got a lot of great stuff. And I think one of the most interesting things that happened was using the Ovilus with the ghost boxes and some of the amazing evidence that we recorded through that. Each box had its own um, evidence that we were able to pull through. One of the more interesting things that happened that day, uh, we were actually using the Ovilus, which we don't put a lot of stake in uh, unless we're using it with the boxes. Uh, it spits out computerized female words. Um, sometimes they're very random. But this time around, uh, something came through that we just couldn't explain. It was a series of words that didn't make sense together. So in editing, I actually flipped uh, and reversed it. And the message that came through at that point was absolutely terrifying. Right after the strange Ovilus uh, voice came through, uh, another thing happened that I still can't explain to this day. Um, listening back to the EVPs, uh, it sounded like my voice, but it wasn't me. Um, saying something along the lines of, Ida, I request your help making beds. Ida, I need extra help today from you guys. And of course that didn't make any sense to me, so I flipped it around and the message that came through there was just frightening. So we had all of the boxes going, which was something you none of us had experienced. And as soon as you turned them on, you could feel like you're you were in like a whirlwind of energy. Was that man a friend of yours that you let in the house? What kind of car did you drive? Did you kill them in the name of someone? And I was standing over by where the fireplace was. I remember that very clearly. And it was interesting during all of the questions, you could hear the girls talking in one box and then all of a sudden something like almost muffling them or covering their mouth or talking over them and they dart to the next box. And in that same voice coming through and finishing their conversation with us. Um, you know, I got to the point where I was calling the killer out during that investigation and asking him the exact questions why he was doing it where he is and things like that and all of a sudden i like can only explain it like i was trying to be silenced by him um, i felt like i had a vice grip through my head my legs felt like they were being filleted um, to the point where i couldn't even talk to you about it i just looked at you and made the motion to take a picture um, which you did and i didn't explain to you until the end what was going on um, but I know during the rest of that event, I was having the um, investigation, I was having a hard time focusing because I literally felt like my legs were being filleted. 
Shocked by the amazing evidence coming through from both the girl spirits and the killer, the team pressed on. At this point, the negative entities began to aggressively taunt the girl spirits in hopes of silencing them. I am here to protect the girls. You're right about that, but I want to find out why you did what you did. It was apparent to the team that the girl spirits were gaining a foothold and becoming more conscious and strong. It was at this time that Chris's spirit technicians and angels began to take over the session. The demon's aggressive tone began to change and even began to plead for a deal in order to stay. Powered by the angels and spirit technicians, the girls realize that they can leave. Then the following segment, you can clearly hear the girls following the spirit technicians' instructions in talking about exiting the location. The energy in the room changed completely and it became evident that the negative entities had been expelled by the spirit technicians and angels. The team knew that the entire house, inside and out, had to be cleared. Along with Elaine, the team walked the entirety of the property using sage and sweetgrass to clear out all negative energy from the inn. Chris invoked all things light in the universe to clear and protect the property. To ensure no negativity may enter again, Chris sealed every doorway and window with sea salt. Um, after we did the investigation and went head to head with demons, the devil, I, I know that sounds crazy, but we did. We have the, the audio and physical evidence to show you. We were able to go through the house and clear the entire house. It was the team going through with Sage and Elaine following us through with Sweetgrass. And I just talked. I just cleared the location and told them that we forgave them, whoever they were, and sent them through to the light. And then after that, I took uh, sea salt and covered every opening in the house and blocked it from any negative entities. Um, the interesting thing with my car is that day when we went to do the cleansing is it had been at the mechanics and they were able to start it 75 times, no problem. So I was like, you know, I told you after we'd done the cleansing, I'm like, well, I turned my phone back on and my mechanic can get the car started, not a problem. And I'll never forget when we came back up into the room, we placed the statue right back up here. And uh, Elaine was standing over by the sink area. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just started crying. Um, we both felt a, a lightness and an airiness that we hadn't felt. Those girls were finally free of what was keeping them in that house. And um, Elaine and I looked at each other and we both started crying because we both felt a sense of relief for not only the girls, but for, for us, for everybody who was there, and for the building in itself. And then all of a sudden, she just started crying. And Dina instinctively walked over to her and hugged her. And they just embraced each other and cried and said, I know, I know, they're gone, I know. And you could feel that oppression. They were, they were out, they were free, and they were able to do anything that they wanted to do. And it was the most amazing feeling. You know, when you start a project and that feeling of completion that you have, this was something different. This was, this was working on helping someone for so long and then just having that opportunity to free them. And the thing that I think I love most about this is, is that that negative entity, that evil, whatever you want to call it, really was coming here to brag. It was coming here 
to oppress the girls, make fun of them, torture them. And in coming here, they really trapped themselves. And we were able to bring in the spirit technicians and as you can hear from the EVP, Michael, take that any way that you want to. And they got all of that negativity out. The team had expelled so much energy freeing the girls and protecting the Lumber Baron Inn that they failed to protect themselves adequately. The events that followed were the stuff of nightmares. After doing the clearing at the Lumber Baron, we thought that everything had ended. Uh, little did we know uh, that the demonic entities had followed us uh, to each of our homes. Um, but during that time frame, I was also having some of the like most intense dreams that usually when I dream, I know I'm dreaming, even when I wake up. Um, they're horrible dreams about either witnessing the girls die or witnessing other team members die. And when I'd wake up, there'd be hooded creatures at the end of my bed is the best way to describe it. We had uh, heard voices, um, items being misplaced. Um, the woman in black, I believe, showed herself a lot more. We have a, a haunting here that is, um, has manifested itself that we, we call the woman in black. And I don't feel threatened by her, but I felt threatened at the time after the clearing. Um, it started in my location when uh, Dean and I started to experience a lot of different negative things that were happening. First thing I remember is that our dogs kept getting sick in the middle of the night. They kept throwing up and, and causing us to wake up and having to clean up after them on a consistent basis. That then led to a smoke alarm just outside of our bedroom uh, that would go off constantly. It didn't matter if we replaced the batteries. Uh, it was just constantly going off and causing a lot of disruption. Uh, we weren't sleeping a lot. We were fighting like cats and dogs. But it all culminated one night when we were downstairs watching TV and dozed on the couch. And basically, uh, I had been watching TV and all of a sudden from the fireplace area, we heard a bang, bang, bang sound. Woke uh, Dina up, the dogs, everybody kind of uh, jumped and freaked out at that point and uh, all of a sudden from behind us on the window we heard another bang 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 and then a few seconds later uh, from the office upstairs uh, and that's where I edited all the EVP for, for uh, the investigation so I remember running upstairs and literally screaming out to the room I know you I know what who you are and what you're trying to do and the next day Dean and I did a complete and total clearing of the house uh, subsequently, uh, my mother called me the next day and was reluctant to tell me that she was having similar experiences at her house, so I ended up having to go down into a clearing for her. Uh, sometime later, we actually did a clearing at Stevie and uh, Jay's house as well, and uh, at that point, we were able to remove all the negative entities uh, from these locations, and I feel like we're free of them today. I really, really believe in my heart of hearts that that if we just examine things from a different viewpoint, no matter what it is, that we can always um, find something triumphant and good. The owners of the Lumber Baron Inn have reported after the cleansing was done, all negative activity has completely ceased. Everyone who enters the building describes an intense feeling of positivity and love. I had no idea the information we were gonna get that day. Uh, I feel whether the police listen to what we have to say, listen to the voices, listen to see the evidence. We solved the crime that day. Um, we not only solved the crime, but were able to free the girls.
retribution, shadows.